it's kind of awkward when you're sitting there facing the crowd, you know, and I was just thinking, they don't realize this. If you're looking up there and notice that my socks mismatch, they mismatch every day, okay? So the prosthetic sock never gets changed hardly at all. And I was sitting there thinking, this is a bad place to be sitting because you could see clearly if my socks mismatch. So if that's OCD bothering some of you, I'm sorry that I've set that switch off inside of you. They do mismatch and they always have and probably always will. It's an honor to be in the Lord's house with the Lord's people, no matter where that may be. And luckily for me, today that's here. And um, I was talking to somebody the other day, I don't even know if it was here, it wasn't here, it was before I got here. And I had said, if I was to ever relocate based on a church decision, Lost River, Bowling Green, Kentucky would be number one choice. Every time I'm here, I just enjoy it. I love it. I love the people. I just, everything about being here has always been a positive experience for me, even from my days in college until till now. And many of you, some of you, not, I guess many, there's a lot of new faces here, but people have been a part of this church since I was in those early days and have some good good memories so thank you for that and thank you for these guys right here on the front area of the building who are interested enough in the Lord to build the relationship they have with him and to make an effort to attend and travel and be in places like this and hats off to them we've talked about some things this weekend that they face and that they deal with and as they communicate to us we begin to realize that at 45 what they're dealing with is a different space than what we dealt with when we were in their shoes trying to understand that and trying to figure out how to help them is a challenge and I'm not saying that we have it knocked out of the park just because we're older than you guys but really hats off and especially this right here they were asked yesterday hey, if you don't mind if you guys could try to sit down in the front that would be really awesome that's all that was said and and they just came right down here and filled the front pew up. So that means a lot to me. And Chad said we've been having some lessons in Matthew 5 and 6, but it was actually Matthew 6 and 5, and then it's like 5 and 7. So every time I'm getting ready to speak, I have to pull up my text message from Chad and go, I got to make sure I'm in the right space here, because it wasn't just 5 through 7. It's been kind of dancing around. And I told him the other day, if I get up and speak on the wrong subject, just know I'll switch it up and go to the other one the next time, you know. So the Sermon on the Mount is just an amazing thing, and, and Jarrett... Um, Friday night just gave an amazing kickoff to what we're talking about and um, if you guys ever slip up and want to get rid of that guy I'm going to be seeing that he lives in North Carolina so don't mess up over here because I'm going to take him so I'm going to go home and tell some people about him so he's on the recruiting list already so you better treat him well I've said nothing but good about him because that's all that I've observed and appreciate what he's doing and, and just another effort to have a layer reaching down to your kids is, is awesome but he did a great job Friday night in getting us to talk and think about just the, the idea of the foundation that Christ is trying to get us to think about. And he had mentioned in his conversation there Friday night at the Keller's home about just the time frame of how long it would actually take if you just listened to the Sermon on the Mount. He kind of gave a round figure. And I went last night and kind of looked at that. And on my particular Bible app and, and the timing and the way it's read, it was like 11 minutes. or I think he said 12 to 15 minutes or something. I was just like... There's more information in what we're getting ready to look at in chapter 5 than I can ever chew through in any given time slot to speak, yet the Lord delivered this information in, in a 15-minute window. And how awesome it would have been to be sitting at the Savior's feet and see his compassion. You know, you, you see it in different movie efforts and Hollywood's made efforts to try to show a compassionate Christ, but what would it really look like? And what would it really feel like if we were able to sit in an environment where Christ himself is speaking these words from his heart to his people? And when we read this text, I want you to try to envision that. What would this be like coming from the Savior? 
delivering a message to people of really what we've kind of titled here in chapter 5 as the, the Beatitudes. And I would challenge you to kind of think of that word Beatitude, if you take out a few letters in there and kind of stretch it out, is to be you attitude, to be your attitude. I think that's a challenge. In Matthew chapter 5, he's trying to get us to see here are some characteristic traits, here are some helpful aids, and here are some tips in ways in which this should be your attitude. This ought to be our attitude. It ought to be my attitude. And then not only does he give you those cues and those tips and these positive efforts, but then he gives you the gainful piece of that behavior. He lets you know, if you can do this, then you will receive this. And it may be something grand, it may be peace, it may be something not seeming so large, but once you experience these things in life, you begin to relish all of the aspects in which he says, this will be yours. Now, it's conditional. You can't just read the text and go, okay, I've acknowledged the Lord in my life. I've put on Christ in baptism. I've, I've clothed myself with him at some point in time. So I want all these things that he lists in, in Matthew chapter 5. It has to be a behavior. It has to be something that we're doing in order to show and execute and carry out these very things that he's given us to think about in Matthew chapter 5. So open your Bibles, if you will. Matthew chapter 5 and starting in verse 1 and seeing the multitudes, I'll read verse 1 while you're trying to find it there, seeing the multitudes he went up on a mountain and when he was seated his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them saying, they came to him. That they came to him, they wanted to hear his teaching, and he says here, we're going to read through these and then come back and then try to dive into them, okay? Let's just hear his words uninterrupted. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before them. That last verse there in verse 12 is kind of like when I look at the book of James and think about if I were a persecuted Christian and I got into his letter, I'd, I might want to punch him in the mouth a couple times. I'm like, you don't know what we're doing out here. You want me to count this joy? You want me to be celebratory? Why don't you come out and hang out with us for a couple weeks before you write a letter like this from a distance? You know, And then you, you get here, Christ and his words, and everything thing sounds inviting. All right, I'm with you. I'll take this. And you give me verse 11 and 12. And I'm like, eh, man, I don't think I want to say I'd want to punch Jesus in the mouth, by the way. I, I'll say that about James, but I'm not saying that about the Lord. It's, it's just almost contradictory. It is contradictory to human behavior. And I will tell you Friday when Jarrett was speaking, 
I leaned over to Lawrence. I said, man, he's got me all nervous now because he used the, well, he says the word blessed and I say the word blessed. I was like, I don't know what I'm supposed to say up there Sunday when I'm reading this stuff, you know? And then he kind of helped me out and he said, well, it depends on where you're from and how you say this. And I said, all right, Lawrence, I think I'm clear, you know? Blessed. I love this. I love even think that word sounds different than blessed even. It just, I love when he used that word in, in, that, in that fashion. All these things he's listing are, are amazing, except for 11 and 12 is kind of really a challenge for me. But even some of those other ones, we're, we're going to dive into them. And I want you just to just sit for a second as you've just heard those words. And by the way, I can't deliver anything the rest of the day any more powerful than the words we just read. We have to chew on them. We have to digest them. We have to try to comprehend them, and we'll, we're trying to do that. That's, that's my effort. But I can't say anything more effective and powerful. That, this section of the Sermon on the Mount, to me, is like a, a section in Proverbs where you just get injection after injection of, man, how do I gnaw on that? That is powerful. Man, that is strong. You know, that is some strong, powerful information. And that's what Christ is doing here. But we're going to go back and look at some of these and kind of talk about some of this in this idea of poor in spirit. So I've just kind of done my homework on what these mean and what, what the work Words are, and I've also tried to do a little bit of diving on what I think it means to me. When I look at this first one about being poor in spirit, my comprehension and my understanding is the idea of making room for God. Be less of you, Scott. Be poorer in your spirit. We'll talk about meekness. I don't want to cross over. And some of these, they naturally do cross over, and they're hard not to keep them somewhat in the same conversation. But making room for God. And I'll be real honest with you. There's times in my life and I've made a lot of room for myself and a little room for God. And any time, in any relationship, in any stride in life that I've been in that space, it does not work well. It has not been victorious times. It is realistic times. It is things that have happened to me. But I think he's saying to us here, if you can be poor in spirit of your own and allow the balloon space of God to fill up as full as it can fill in your heart and in your soul and in your mind, great things are going to happen. And I have in my notes here, we have need for God. Make room for him. Make room for him. And in a room of this nature of a bunch of faithful people, I'm sure that we'd like to think, well, that's what we're all doing, isn't it? And I'm sure we are. But is there not an opportunity for, at least in my life, I know it's true, is there not an opportunity for us to make more room for him? To be poor in spirit of my own space and make room for God. What if my tone... What if my conversation, what if my speech was that to be more like that which God would have me to be? What if my reaction to the treatment that you or anyone else gives me is so automatically, naturally responsive in a righteous manner because of how much space I'm giving God in my heart and in my soul and in my mind? Make room for God. And you might say, okay, that sounds good. And I'm, I'm going to do that. Well, how am I going to do that? Well, sometimes you're going to have to get rid of some things that are taking up some space. In order to make room for God, you're going to have to move some things out of the way. You're going to have to maybe cut some things out that are taking up too much of your time and your energy and your effort. You're going to have to find a way to give God more of your availability. It's not just going to happen because we're reading it here today and sitting in this auditorium and chewing on good thoughts and we're just going to walk out of here and all of a sudden God's going to just overconsume us because we thought about it. That's not going to happen. We got to do. You got to do. And this is the practical piece of his teaching. Do this, okay? Make room for God. Okay, make room for God. Matthew 5 and verse 3. Because what? Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I want a lot of things in life. Physical things. We talked about that in other parts of this message from Christ. I love possessions and I love things and maybe you got the same battle. Whether my behaviors show it or not, and whether it can always be observed that this is the case, there's nothing I want more than the kingdom of heaven. 
And if that's a true statement, for where your heart is, there your treasure will be also, right? Some other conversations we can have in this space. We got to make room for God, okay? You get to this next statement here, verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn. God hath need of you in this space. So when I look at this idea of mourning, and I, I don't mean to diminish, I'm not trying to say God is not capable, don't mishear what I'm saying right here, but God is not physical and God is not tangible. He is spiritual and He is capable. I totally comprehend that. But He is not physical and He is not tangible. What I mean by that is, if I'm in a condition of mourning, or I'm in a condition or a space of need in life. I can pray to the Father. I can ask He comfort me. I can ask that He be with me. I can do all those things and He can reply and answer all those requests. Not denying that. But what He can't do is He can't physically be in the presence of my mourning and my need. But you know who can? You can. When there is a need for comforting, I have in here in my notes, this is our tangible opportunity to show up. Show up. You can't hear about a brother or sister in need and say, man, I know they're really in a bad space and their mother or father's health or their child's health or whatever. They, I re, I'm going to pray for them. Do that. Keep doing that. Don't, don't stop doing that. But in my opinion, if those who mourn from Christ's words are going to be comforted, surely there's some assumption on his part in that statement that my people are going to care for my people and they're going to take care of one another. I've experienced that. I, I went through uh, a mourning space of physical challenges in my own life and for years, for months and years, people of God showed up. They didn't just text me and tell me they were praying for me, they showed up and they tangibly touched and were comforting me in a time of need. We got to show up. We can't just hear about opportunities and talk about them and say, hey, I'm, I'm praying for them. Are you praying for them? Yeah. Has anybody drove over there? Has anybody sat in their house and been by them? I talk about one guy in particular in my, um, my traumatic situation with my leg loss and his name is Jarrett Gresham. Jared Gresham is a, he's a NASCAR um, pop rivet kind of fabrication guy. He, he builds the race cars and he's very knowledgeable, but he's a very quiet guy. You, know, you would never know what he does if you're hanging around him. He wouldn't really probably tell you what he does. And I, I have a relationship with Jared, but I don't have like a hangout all the time relationship with Jared. And I would wake up sometimes in my hospital bed and I'd look over and Jared would just be standing in my room. He, there was an HVAC return on the wall. I remember right on the wall, kind of in this area, my bed was over here, and he, he'd just be standing here. He'd be standing in my room. I don't know how long he'd been standing there. And I'd come to, and I'd think, man, I don't really know if I have the energy to talk, you know, or say much to Jarrett. He wasn't, he wasn't talking to me. He's kind of a, he didn't, he does not a big conversational guy. He'd just stand in my room. And I think there's three times I remember waking up in the days I was in the hospital, that Jarrett Gresham was just standing in my room. He showed up. He comforted. I think that's what the Lord's expecting. Is that we do the peace of his thought process of his church and its function. His power in it. I mean, it's, it's an emotional response from a guy that did what? Drove to Charlotte, parked in a parking deck, and walked into my room. He comforted me. Do our part. Show up. The Lord, the Lord has need of us. Verse 5, this idea of meekness is, um, oh man, I really just, I wish meekness was tied to my name, but it's just not. It's just not, it's just not a, I'm kind of harsh and brash and coach and athlete and go and push and shove and bull, you know, that's just kind of who I am, trying to fix those things and be more like the Lord would have me to be, but meekness is, gentle and soft can be the, the definition of that word, and I think we all understand someone who's gentle and soft. 
but it also has the idea of just having a lower, or as I've put in my notes, a proper self-value of yourself. Meekness is suppressing the thought of me. Humility is not thinking that I'm better than you. But meekness is saying I'm going to put a proper, I don't want to use the word low because we're not supposed to be low valued people. We're created beings in the Lord. But we are to be meek, gentle and soft and also carrying a proper placed value on ourselves. And when you do that, man, you can do a lot of things for a lot of other people when you're not elevating yourself and you're not pushing yourself out to the front and you're not trying to overvalue who you are and say, well, look, well, what about me? Well, don't, don't forget about me, 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 me. Meekness. The question is for you. It's not for me to answer. Do you have a proper value system of yourself? Are you in a place where it says, I acknowledge I am humbly a servant of the Lord's and gentle and soft. I mean, you, you can, you know, I remember dealing with my grandpa as a kid. The last thing on his title would be meekness. <laughs> he was a Marine and he was uh, a converted person. He came to the Lord late in life. So he brought a lot of bad things with him for a long time. And when you worked around grandpa, even though as kids we, we knew him as a Christian, you might hear words and see behaviors that were unexpected of, you know, what just was kind of out of character. And there was one time we were working on a deck and building something with him and trying to help my dad and he work. And I don't know, a dog I think ran through or something. And my grandpa, when we talk about patience, he has a fuse about that long. And then after the fuse goes off, it's TNT dynamite. It doesn't, there's no migration. It's things are going well and then things are going awful real quick. And uh, something had happened and I don't know, grandpa grabbed a two by four and he threw it at the dog and he kicked a post on the deck and um, we were like in second grade. You know, I'm like terrified. And me and my brothers are like, what's happening next, you know? And my dad's laying under the deck right there close to my grandpa and he, my dad's acting like he's biting my grandpa's ankles. Like he's you know, getting him back for us, you know, trying to break the tension or whatever. He's trying to let us know it's okay to settle down, to you chill out. If you're not meek and you're not gentle and you're not soft, you can create some tension. You can create some negative environments and negative experiences for those around you. The Lord's saying meekness, blessed Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And that one, I'll be honest, I dig on that one. I've dug on that one. I've pried into that one. I can't come up with a whole lot more other than you're just going to have some earthly benefits is where I can get. You'll, you'll inherit the earth. It's just a, it's a tough one for me to, to get much further than that. Do you have the proper self-value on yourself? Have you placed yourself? I can tell you right now, I got a lot of work to do in that space. Hopefully that's not the answer for you, but have you placed yourself in a proper value system where the Lord would have you? You get to verse 6, he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. We were sitting at the table at Dave and Melanie's house just minutes ago, talking about how we like our steak cooked, you know, and we all were in a, a medium well category. And I know that makes you guys curl your toes out there here like that rare, raw, medium, rare blood dripping off your plate kind of steak, but you ever have something that you just hunger and thirst for? Sydney, my daughter, she hungers and thirsts for a Toyota Tacoma in a way that I didn't know you could hunger and thirst for, you know? Right now she's driving her 01 Nissan Maxima trying to deal with that, but she has a hunger. She want, you don't have to know. I just, I had a text message on my way here, or maybe the day before I left town where she was in Alabama. It's a picture of a kind of a matte, matte gray, flat gray Tacoma parked in Athens, Alabama. She says, put this on the Christmas list, you know. You know what it's like when somebody wants something, you know, you can sense it. You don't really have to ask, do you, are you interested in those trucks, Sydney? I didn't, I didn't know you are interested in it. We know. She shows her efforts, her, her ideas, her thoughts, her, her, her vision. Her, she's, she tells you, that's what you... What about your hunger and your thirst for righteousness? Is that something that you're 
and, and Sydney's pursuing that as well, thankfully. All my kids are pursuing that. But are we pursuing righteousness with an appetite of what it means to hunger and thirst? Hunger and thirst. I love to drink sweet tea and I love to drink Big Red. Dave hooked me up. He found some Big Reds and brought them in the house this weekend and brought me one yesterday. I was excited to have it. But you're really supposed to drink a lot of water, you know? I mean, water is supposed to be the hydration of choice. And in the fitness space, you'd think that I would be doing a lot more of that, but it's just not a, I'm not the best water drinker. Well, I was just out in Phoenix, Arizona, in Southern Utah for a couple of weeks with the family. I'm gonna tell you, you'll get in some places where all you want is water. And you know what it's like to come up off the poor choice that this guy made to ask his family to hike down to the Grand Canyon, some of it, and hike back out. They, I ruined the South Rim Grand Canyon experience for my kids. I made a poor choice and picked a trail that was just idiotic for an amputee to even go after. But all I wanted on that trail was I, my, I kept hearing my water bottle kind of start to rattle and getting loose. I'm like, I'm going to be out of water. If you, if you are in need and you know the nutritional benefit of something, in this case, be it water, you will do whatever you have to, to get a hold of it. You know what that is like to hunger and thirst. Because you've had that cotton in your mouth feeling or you realize, man, I'm not even sweating. I must be so dry. You, know, you hunger and thirst. What about righteousness? What about that? Is that something that you wake up in the morning and say, Lord, give me the strength to go find more of it. Help me pursue righteous behaviors. Put me in a position that that's my pursuit today. Help me. No, we, we, we pursue anything and everything and kind of bring righteousness with us because we're faithful people. Maybe we're doing our thing and we're not in the just cram it pursuit and go get righteousness. The Lord's saying, blessed are you who hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's got to be something that's a diligent effort. It can't just be lethargically hoping, well, hope going to church is just going to come in and I'm going to, I'm going to leave it on the, really, I've got a Bible class teacher and there's a preacher there. That's their job. And I told the kids yesterday, we did the math that our time here together is like 1.7% of the hours we have in a week. I'm going to just chalk it up to them and let them, they're, they're responsible to feed me. And that's good. That is a great source of being fed, I hope. But you have to be, it says, blessed are you when you hunger and you thirst for righteousness. I wish I could tell you that that's the only pursuit and that's where I am all the time. And then this next one, man, I need you to do it for me if you're ever around me or in my life or ever will be. And that is give me mercy. Blessed are the merciful. For they shall receive mercy. Humility is required in this space. Realizing that you too fall short of the Lord's teaching. And my older brother John, I, I've used this example in many places and I'm always fearful that when I tell it, they go, oh, I heard that the last time he was here, but it's the best example of mercy that I know of personally. And he was, he's always bigger than me. And uh, I was telling the kids yesterday about a time when he pulverized a walnut on my forehead one time. So you can imagine some of the exchanges we had as kids growing up. But uh, he wanted to play me in the game of mercy. You know, I don't even know if I see kids play mercy anymore, but um, I guess they, maybe they play it on their game now. They text the words mercy back and forth or something. I don't know. <laughs> and maybe you bend their hands or something. I don't know. But mercy for me as a kid, you would interlock hands and face each other and you would just see who had the greater forearm strength and the greater grip strength and just try to just pin them down or sometimes guys would flip it upside down and, and wail on it, you know. And if you got into a position that you were being overpowered or you wanted to be relieved from, you would call out, mercy, mercy. And the intention was, that was the flag being dropped and they would back off. And typically they did. And my brother John, for whatever reason, like an idiot, I decided to play him in a game of mercy. And he got me upside down and he's, I mean, he was just cranking my forearms backwards, you know, and I'm screaming, 
mercy, mercy. And he's like, you don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. And he's just wailing on me, you know. And I'm like, my goodness, I thought that was part of the rule. You win. I'm overpowered. Mercy, I concede, you know. And my dad was sitting at the table there studying for a lesson. And he, he put his pen down. He said, John, he said, you, you mind if I, will you play me in a game of mercy? And he said, yeah, I'll play you, dad. And so my dad gave him the exact same treatment. And, and he got John in a situation. And John starts crying out for mercy. And he said, it's interesting, son, that when you need it, you're begging for it. But when you're asked of it, you're resistant. He says, when you're in need of mercy, and I've been in need of mercy, you'll beg for it. But how are we doing in the dispensing department of mercy when somebody else hath need? Are we cranking on them? Are we telling them why they don't deserve it? Are we giving them every reason why I'm not going to give mercy in your corner? The Lord says, blessed are the merciful. We could all do better in the dispensing of that, okay? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. There's not many people, even through our reading of the Lord's book, that were able to look upon God ever, right? I mean, they had to tell the people to turn their back at the base of the mountain. You know, God's going to come down and speak to Moses. I don't want them to see. They hear the thunder, the lightning. They can't even see his face. And how, how that you could be told, don't do that. It's just like a child. If you tell them, don't do this, what's the very thing they're going to do? The very thing you said, do not do, right? Imagine being in a situation knowing God is near or he's brought himself nearer in his words to the situation there and being told, do not look upon him. You cannot look upon him. And, and not being able to see God, right? We hear him come through the garden. We got some other situations where it seems like we get real close to maybe seeing or being where God is, but it's really nothing that I can say is fair for us that we could really say, yep, a lot of people have seen God in our documented recordings in the Lord's book. I want to see God. I want to have the permission and I want to be in a place where I am granted the opportunity to look upon the Father. Because it's been such a restricted situation because of who he is and where sin exists and where light and darkness are. And I understand why he has to keep himself in a place where he can't be looked upon. I, I may not like it, but I can comprehend it. And he says here in this text, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. You want to see God? It requires righteous behaviors now. It requires that we do right now. We have to execute these things so that we can see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. I was talking to Dave and Melanie about the efforts with Luke and Carol and I have an adopted son. Our first son is adopted, Kobe. And we're talking about the punishment, discipline conversation and how we were basically berated in that whole situation by our home study person. Well, I'm maybe exaggerating, but they just kept wanting to know, are we going to hit the child? You know, that was their term. We talk about corporal punishment and well, when you hit the child, you know, they just kept making us feel bad about that. No one had that conversation with my dad. No, no one asked him, right, is this going to be something you do or don't do? And he had permission to just do it, I guess. And I've always thought, they give adoptive parents more coaching. And, and when you have a birth child, you just go home. Remember, we left the hospital with Sydney. I looked at Carol. I said, this is it. We just walk out. There's no, there's no restrictions. There's no rules. You know, whatever. Um, corporal punishment was a thing that happened in, in our house. 
and I was the negotiator. Any time I knew infractions had happened, rules had been broken, and spankings are coming, I would step to the front. I mean, I'd always be sitting there. My brother John, would be, he'd always be popping his knuckles. I could hear him back. He was getting nervously ready. Just to, He loved to resist it. My dad would hit him hard. He'd just stand there like, doesn't bother me, you know. And, but I was the negotiator. Dad, dad, listen, seriously. If you let us go today, next time you can spank us twice as hard as you are today. I mean, just offering all this, this trying to, can we have a peaceful negotiation process. And my brother would say sometimes, would you just shut up and take a beating? Let's get out of here and go play ball. You know, just, it's, it's in, you know, whatever. But just wanting, I just wanted peace. I don't, I don't want to have a beating here. I don't want to be in a bad situation with my father. You know, peace. Do you want peace? It doesn't just happen. Peace doesn't just happen. If you just allow human heart rates to elevate, blood pressures to go up, voice volumes to get loud, and you just let human interaction happen, I promise you, you will not naturally come to peace. You have to manage the tone. You have to realize my heart rate's up. You've got to recognize my blood pressure is through the roof. Maybe right now I need to go and get away from this and settle down. You have to work at peace. Peace does not just happen. No matter how calm we are, we are humans. And I was telling the kids yesterday, anytime you've seen some type of physical altercation anywhere, its volume goes up, hits the eardrum, elevates the heart rate, blood pressure goes up, volume goes up louder, fists are being thrown. It's a process. And in that process, there's four, five, six things I'm listing that I've seen happen. You can stop and work towards peace. You can be a peacemaker. That's what the writer's saying here. Man, we need some peacemakers. If we don't have peacemakers, we'll be fighting all over the place. And so you have to, number one, be a peacemaker. And number two, be willing to concede when someone's seeking peace. If someone's trying so hard to get peace and negotiate the thing down and you're still swinging and hitting and shoving, we're never going to get there. No matter how much the peacemaker wants peace, they have to have peaceful participants. You got to be a participant in order for peace to come to the table. And the Lord's looking for, he's seeking and wanting peacemakers. He needs peacemakers. If that's something that you've got and that's a stronghold, do not stand on the side. I can't stand these things in our society today. When you see something getting ready to happen, there's seven men over here. There's two guys right here, and why these seven guys couldn't go grab them and pull them apart. Instead, they get out their phones, and they can't wait to put this on YouTube, Instagram, whatever, and they want to show a fist fight. I'm like, you guys couldn't put your phones in your pocket and say, guys, guys, let's settle down. Somebody say something and, and initiate peace. It doesn't take, but sometimes one, one word to go, hey, settle down, guys, just a second. Just somebody else to go, hey, hey, back up, you know, just, just a second before that heart rate goes up another notch and body temperature starts coming through the roof and foreheads are sweating, you might get offer something to lead them to peace. The Lord's looking for you. He has need for you. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. I, I love being a son of my father. And a son of my mother. I love when people ask me if that's who. I had a guy stop in last night. He's driving through Bowling Green. He lives down in Somerset, Kentucky. And he knew I was here. Uh, Don, I just forgot his name. But anyway, his last name. Came to seek me out to just stop in the building where we were last night and say hello because of how much he respects my father. I like being the son of my father. But let that not be elevated over the opportunity to be called a son of God. Man, I want to be that. I want to be a son of God. I want that title. I want that opportunity. If you have that opportunity, desirous of the same that I do, then be a peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers. 
for they shall be called sons of God. And then verse 10 is really where it kind of makes a flip. You know, everything here has been kind of just some passive, positive behaviors, if you would allow me that term. Just passive, positive, you don't have to be going over the top. Maybe peacemaking does require you to do some, sometimes peacemakers do got to kind of step in in the moment of friction and there is a chance of harm coming your way. And I guess there's a great chance of harm, right? Sometimes you try to make peace and people will shred you because you're trying to simply get people to hey let's back down well no he's wrong he's wrong. maybe you're both wrong let's just back off for a second you know so I guess there is some but but until this statement I think it's pretty okay for us to say those are things that we could do you know those are things I could just find myself wanting to do and then you get to this statement here Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now don't get confused like Scott Sandusky gets confused when he's being persecuted for wrongdoing and try to call that righteous persecution. Sometimes you do wrong and you face the negative consequence of those things and I have done that and I try to justify that and say, well, I don't know why I'm being so persecuted. And you have to step back and look in the mirror and say, because you failed in your responsibility, Scott, and you're facing the persecution of those decisions. Don't confuse the two. He's talking about righteous persecution. I can remember one time playing basketball in the early days when we were, you know, now they've come back. You guys are wearing short shorts again. You know, I'm even buying shorts that expose my kneecap and my daughter freaks out. You know, they're like coming up here and showing my quad muscle a little bit. Dad, what are you doing? I'm like, that's what I can purchase right now. You know, they don't make these things like, anyway, the shorts were short and we were trying to make them longer, kind of in the modest effort. So my mom had sewn me my own pair of white polyester shorts and she even took them to the local sports store and had my number printed on the bottom and I had them on for our first game and no one knew I had had them my mom had just been making them for me kind of in the background and my coach comes in and is like well, what are you wearing those for I'm like well my, my mom made them for me I just want to wear them just the Christian in me just trying to be a modest thing or whatever here and he's like you're going to look like an idiot out there that's what he said to me. I was in the sixth grade. And I mean, I was just in the locker room. I'm terrible. And luckily, my dad had just walked in. He was helping coach the team. He was standing behind the coach. He didn't interrupt the persecution. He didn't stop anything. He just kind of smiled behind the guy and told me just to give me a hand signal. That's a moment of righteous persecution at, at, at the sixth grade level. That's very small. But I can remember it, you know, at 45, I can still talk about it. There may be things going on in your life where you're doing right and you're being pushed back upon and you're being persecuted and don't you quit. Don't you quit. Okay, read this last passage and then we'll, we'll wrap up our thoughts here. He says, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward. It is not in this earth. Listen to this statement. If you're looking for earthly deliverance in the Lord's department, you might not be too thrilled about this statement. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. It's nothing new. It's nothing new. It's nothing new that someone before you, someone before me, serving the Lord, has not faced. Persecution has happened. It's going to happen. It's going to continue to happen. Don't think you're on some island of, well, look at me. I'm the only person being... He says, this has been going on. This has been going on from, from, from since the Lord's been having people on this earth. They've been persecuted. Your reward is not earthly deliverance. The reward is great, and it is in heaven. That's where the Lord is pointing us. Think about where we're going and not where we are and what we're doing right now. But do the righteous requirements that are listed here so that we can be called sons of God and rejoice in that reward when we find ourselves in heaven.
Thank you very much. For